Lord. Hallelujah. You're welcome once again to Christ Disciples Institute. The Discipleship School of the Light for All Nations Mission. We are running a program, the Applied Biblical Studies, and we are in season or session two of the Applied Biblical Studies program. This session two is termed Christian Dynamics. And we started it about two weeks ago. This is the third week. In the first week, we looked at uh, various uh, causes. You can go back to the videos to check. Today, we are taking the third one, CD203. CD203, Disciple Making. Disciple Making. This topic is a very important uh, topic because it is the core of our faith. The church has two major responsibilities. Number one is evangelism. Number two is discipleship. And these two factors are embedded in this term, disciple making. All right, we'll start by reading Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, and Matthew 28, verse 19. We'll read them together as one, starting with Matthew 28, 19, and ending with Galatians 4, 19. Say, so go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. My little children, of whom I travel in bed again, until Christ be formed in you. Until Christ, until Christ be formed in you. Now, from the place we have just read, you see that, the primary assignment that Jesus Christ gave the disciples before he went, he said, go into the world and do what? And make disciples. Now, making disciples is what Paul described in Galatians 4.19, traveling in bed until Christ is formed in you. That traveling in bed could be the process that involves winning of souls, maturing them, by the word of God and through prayers until they become like Christ. They have known Christ, but they have to become like Christ. I told us a story some time ago about some firemen who brought out a man from the uh, manhole and he had drank some of the things from the manhole. When they brought the man out from the manhole, they said, praise God, we brought him out of that mess. But now, We've got to take the mess out of him. In evangelism, we go to bring the people out of the mess of sin and death through the gospel. And in discipleship, we bring the mess out of them. So it is what Paul had described. I am walking, I am doing this thing, that traveling in bed is the process that goes on until this person who have come to know Christ have become like Christ. Hallelujah. So he didn't just say, go into the world and gather people to come and fill your church. He said, make disciples. Make disciples. Now, making disciples is of various you know, understanding. We're going to look into it and know how we can go about doing that. Now, if you look at what Jesus Christ said in the place we read in Matthew 28, 19, you point out in some major things there. He said, go into all the world. And number one, preach the gospel. Now, if you combine it with other places where Jesus Christ made this statement, you will see two things pointed out. Go into the world and preach the good news to every creature, teaching them to observe all things that I have what commanded you. So, that make disciples of all nations is grouped into preaching the good news and teaching them. So we preach and then we teach. Hallelujah. 
Therefore, it is obvious that disciple making starts with what? Soul winning. And soul winning is the process of persuading one to accept what you have brought to them. And what we have brought to the people is good news. When Philip went to Samaria, he preached Christ to them. There are so many things that have been preached, but he preached what? Christ. Hallelujah. Baptizing them into the Father. Hallelujah. He baptized them into, into the Father because of what the Son have done through the Holy Spirit. It's not about the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a process. The Father is the source. It is through what the Son has done that we are brought in union with the Father. And it is the Holy Spirit that makes sure that that union is established. So, our going out to make disciples is to reconcile men to God. In our previous lessons, we have talked about God's reconciliation plan. And you see that this disciple making is part and parcel of our duty to go out there and do what God wants us to do. And it starts with, disciple making starts with what? Evangelism. Evangelism is the proclamation of good news. The good news of what God have done for us in Christ Jesus. That through Christ, he has liberated us from the power of sin and death. Hallelujah. What religious laws could not do, what moral instructions could not do, what traditional laws could not do, what you know, punishments could not do, God did by sending his son, Jesus Christ, and releasing that spirit of Christ into us so that we become new being, new creation, and we become one. Say, so therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Hallelujah. So by preaching of the gospel, we, we are winning their soul. We are making them to change their mind, to repent and accept this work of salvation that has been accomplished in Christ Jesus. That is what we are doing. Then after they have done that, we now mentor them. Mentor them until they are matured and become strong men and women of God. Hallelujah. So you see, you preach, and then through the teaching and the training in the word of God, you are making them to become matured men and women of God. Now, in the evangelism stage, we have introduced them to the finished work. Religion told you about the work you will do to be saved. But in, in, in evangelism, we tell you that the work has been done. All you have to do is to come into the perfection that the work that, that, that has been completed in Christ. It is called finished work, meaning that there is no other work for you to do. Come into what has been done. And it is good news because I have to enjoy from what I have not labored for. I have received life eternal in Christ Jesus. I am not struggling to get life eternal. And now... After I have made that person to understand and accept this thing, the Holy Spirit takes over. The Bible says, having believed, you are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. That is a guarantee to eternal life. Hallelujah. Now, when you have received that, we now begin to do what? To pray for you, to teach you, to guide you until you become matured. Praise the Lord. Now, uh, 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 Paul said, after talking about having seen with the Holy Spirit, he says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened so that you may know who you now are. And that is what the process of discipleship does. So in evangelism, we win the soul. In discipleship, we mature you in Christ. So it is called evangelism and discipleship, which put together gives you disciple making you are making disciple by winning the soul to christ and then by teaching and instructing until the person is matured enough to reproduce to do the same thing that have been done for him hallelujah now in the lesson one of this uh, uh, course let's look at three levels of christian discipleship now there are three levels of discipleship, how it goes. Number one is the discipleship process between a believer and a non 
believer. In this level, you are witnessing to the person to know Christ. So that's number one. Between the work is between me, the believer, and the other person out there who have not yet believed in Jesus Christ. Whether the person is in church or outside of the church, irrespective of anywhere, because we have many who have not received Christ, but they are in church, but they are religious. But through the power of the gospel, their eyes are open. Remember, Paul was a religious person. But he says that all the things he was doing, he was doing them in ignorance. Because what religious does is to put you in ignorance and make you to operate so powerfully in your ignorance. And the results you get as a result of the workings in your ignorance makes you to believe that your ignorance is actually wisdom. But when the Lord opened the eyes of Paul, he realized that he was serving God that he does not know. Just like Samuel was serving the Lord in the temple in Shiloh, but he did not know God. Until the Spirit of God appeared to him by the word of God. And then he began to know who he is serving. So the first level of discipleship is where we, the believers, are helping the unbeliever to accept Christ. The second level is we are another kind of discipleship, not only the unbeliever and the believer now, like we have said earlier. It, it, let it not just look like discipleship is all about believer and unbeliever, believer and unbeliever. It goes beyond that because after you have believed, you are no longer an unbeliever, but discipleship still continues. So number two is between a matured believer and a new believer. First one, we have won the person to Christ, so he's no longer an unbeliever. Discipleship does not end there. We continue the next level of discipleship where we now begin to do iron sharpened iron. The older believer begin to mentor the new believer with the aim of helping him mature through spiritual nurturing. Hallelujah. Helping him. So teaching them to observe all things that I have taught you. So in that process, you are helping the child in the Lord to become an adult. Not to be babies in the Lord. Because as a baby in the Lord, you'll be taking milk. You will not know how to know what is right from wrong. You can be tossed about here and there by every wind of doctrine. That is why it is dangerous for that baby Christian to become a pastor. If he becomes a pastor, he will begin to go to grab anything he sees that sounds like God. Anything that looks like God anywhere, he will be chopping it. He doesn't know how to distinguish between the right and the wrong. And some people who are older, older believers and older teachers who have deviated take advantage of these ignorant new believers and begin to teach them things that will destroy them instead of helping them to grow in grace through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, they begin to give them the knowledge of other things. So, in discipleship, we are a mature believer who is centered on Christ, is helping this new believer to also become matured in the Lord, so that he will not be tossed about here and there by every wind of doctrine. So that he will not go and be eating poison. I remember many years ago, you know, a little baby was, was sitting down and then, you know, and then the baby baby pooped. Sorry to use this example. The baby baby pooped and then because the baby is hungry, he didn't know that that is poo. He began to pick that same poo and was about to eat it. Then I met all, uh, 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 an elder brother and rushed and said, ah, take it from him and clean up the, her, hands, her hands and, you know, clean her up. That is mentoring. You see, this new baby in Christ don't know what is shit and don't know what is the gospel. He doesn't know the difference between the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Moses, the gospel of Elijah. He doesn't know. All he knows is everything waiting for Bible is the Bible. And so he chopped. If he just hear Jesus, he doesn't know the difference between bad Jesus and uh, 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 another kind of Jesus and Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The one who died to save it. He doesn't know. All he knows is that all Jesus be Jesus. All Bible be Bible. All pastor be pastor. All preaching be preaching. Anything he sees on television that somebody says in Jesus' name, he jumps. But if he is being mentored and guided, he will not fall into that trap. I was, I was a young man. I was trying to mentor in the Lord. And then one day somebody took him to go and see a man of God. And he followed the person to go and see the man of God. The so-called man of God was now introducing him to animal sacrifice where you use blood of animal to bath him. 
And because I have taught him most of these things, he got up and walked out of that place. What if I have not taught him? Because the person answered man of God, he will quickly submit to that kind of demonic uh, occultic ritual that many people now today are doing in the name of Christ. That's the essence of this discipleship. I'm not going to this example again because it is simply opening your mind to the essence of discipleship. So number two, as I said earlier, is between a mature believer and a new believer. But that does not end there. It is not only mature believer and unbeliever, or mature believer and a new believer. But discipleship can also continue in the process of a mature believer and another mature believer. Between a mature believer and another mature believer. In this lesson, two or more mature believers are helping each other to grow more in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is iron sharpened iron. This is where fellow believers together who are matured, they rub, they rub minds, they hobnob, they learn from each other. Hallelujah. Paul say, I am coming to you, Romans chapter 1, I am coming to visit you to impart some what? Some grace to you so that I and you will impart each other. I impart to you, you impart to me. So in this case, true knowledge we share. If you look at scientists, that's one, one thing about science that is powerful. When a scientist discovers anything, he does not just teach it. He gathers, he, he prepares the document and presents it before other science, scientists. They look at it and by the time they come to a conclusion, it is now a scientific law. So, in this case, a mature believer is helping another mature believer. A, a, a minister of gospel is helping another minister of the gospel. Both of you are helping each other. Iron sharpened iron. Two are better than one. So, discipleship, level one, believer and unbeliever. Level two, mature believer and a new believer. Level three, a mature believer and another mature believer. I hope it's clear. All right. The next thing I want us to learn is in the lesson two, Jesus Christ and discipleship. Now, we must know that Jesus Christ did not simply ask disciples to go and make disciples. All his life, he was involved in disciple making. That is why he asked them to do exactly what he did. And that's why when we are discipling anybody, we are looking for that that person will do exactly what we have done. Now, the vision of making disciples originated from Jesus Christ. In his earthly ministry, Jesus' central focus was on discipling men who will become those who are, that will carry on his ministry. Now, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus Christ asked Peter and Matthew to follow and Andrew to follow him. And then he told them, Follow me, and I will what? Make you fishers of men. Jesus raised 12 men, trained them. And they set the standard and pattern on how godly life and godly teaching can be passed across, both through lifestyle and words. Bible says Moses was a man who was mighty in words and in works. Jesus Christ went about doing good. He said what Jesus Christ began to do and to teach. So in the style of discipleship as seen in Jesus Christ, it was not just teaching. The disciples are actually made to become very close to you. That is the pattern of discipleship even in those days. Now, the person I'm discipling must be very close to me. Must even in those days, cry, you have to come and live in my house. And you know, you know, like you are mentoring you, training you, you are like my apprentice. You are learning through my words, through my character, through observation, and through hearing. It's not everything your, your mentor will say with his mouth. Some of, that, some of the things you learn, you, if he says anything about the word of God, you see it in his life. And then you too, you learn. It is not as if he is putting that in you, but it is helping you to activate what is in you. For example, there was an ego that, you know, found itself among chicken. And all his life, he grew up as a chicken. Then one day, an ego appeared. When the eagle appeared, the eagle discovered that this is an eagle among chicken. All the chicken ran away. This eagle also ran away. But eventually, one of the days, the eagle did not run away when the chickens ran away. He stood there and looked at this big eagle. It looked like it. 
Now, this big eagle began to teach the smaller eagle how to fly. He brings out his wing. And then he does many things that when this one now copied it, it also fly. Now, that big eagle did not transfer the anointing of flying into the small eagle. Are you hearing me? The small eagle did not tap the anointing of flying. He already had the anointing of flying inside of him. All the big ego did is to help him realize what is in him. So I am not coming to the, 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 the senior person in the Lord to tap his grace or to tap his anointing or to tap his power. No, I am learning from him on how to develop what I already have. He said, the anointing which you have received shall teach you all things. You don't need another person to teach you another thing. That another teaching means the person is not transferring himself to you. He is helping you to discover whom God has made you. That's why Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding be what? Enlightened. So that you may know the inheritance that you already have in Christ. So if I am born again, everything about God is already in me. But my mentors or my teacher or my discipler is helping me to bring out myself. I remember when some years ago when I was in the school, I, I, I met one man who has, you know, these big church people. You know, I want to also have, you know, do some exercise. And then he took me to the field early in the morning. Every day I should come out 4 a.m. I will come out with my canvas. We will roll around the field, roll around the field. After which he will now bring some heavy blocks put on my leg. He will do it. It's all very easy. I will struggle until he graduates. He said, bring out what is in you. Bring out the muscles are there. Bring them out. Bring them out. God had that was what he was telling me. He said, God have given you the muscles. Bring them out. Don't hide them. So you see, the man was not giving me his muscles. He's helping me to bring out my own muscle that God has given to me. Unfortunately, today, what most preachers tell you that you don't have anything. I am coming to give you. I am coming to put into you what God has put into me. God have not. God did not ask me to put into you what he has put into you. It's to help me realize what he has put into me. Paul told Timothy, steer up the spirit that is in you by the laying on of our hand. When he said by the laying on of our hand, when uh, uh, Timothy received Christ, that was the laying on of the hand. They, are now. He, they, they prayed for him, the, the salvation prayer, and he accepted Christ. He says, steer that power. Something is in you. For God have not given you the spirit of fear. There's a spirit in you. There's a spirit in man. The inspiration of the Almighty that makes him what? Wise. And your mentor in discipleship is helping you to bring it out. That was what Jesus did. He said, follow me and I will make you. And Jesus raised this man and trained them to live exemplarily. And they manifested that character and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Becoming like him. You know, because of association. He, they became like him. He has already given them that, that grace. So he told them, okay, do not go anywhere until you receive the Holy Spirit. So in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the Holy Spirit came on each and every one of them. None of them tapped from each other. Everybody received his own. And then they became witnesses unto Christ. And that was what he meant by, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. It is called the Great Commission. Praise the Lord. I hope it is clear. Now, there's another thing I want us to learn about discipleship. We have talked about the three levels of discipleship. Let me talk about the three methods of discipleship. Of discipleship. Now, this three method is method in which we can help one to know Christ and become matured in him. But I must point out something. That the method I use may not be generalized. I can mentor one person in one way and mentor another person in one way because of individual differences. The level of understanding may differ. Even in our Bible school, we don't teach everybody, you know, at the same level. We, we even during the exams, I try to find out your level and I know the kind of exams I will give to you. And some people, I, the exam look tougher. Some other people, the exam looks easier. To the eyes of these people, it will be easy. To the eyes of these people, it will be cheap. So you see, it is not generalized. We are not boxing everybody into one. We give you individualized instruction and give you the opportunity to interact one-on-one -on -one with your lecturer 
and understand what you are learning. Now, I want to point out here that most people go to Bible school to get certificate to look for job. Please, that is not the reason for Bible school. If you are going to a Bible school or a theological seminary as if we are, you are going to prepare yourself to steer up what is in you for the work of the ministry. You may think you know. I remember somebody who registered with our Bible college. By the time he came in, through the lectures, he discovered he was not even born again. But he was desiring to be a preacher. <laughs> it was in the Bible school that he got saved and then was baptized. And then he started from the scratch until he was ordained a preacher. It took some years anyway. Praise the Lord. So the desire is not bad, but God used that desire to bring him to the college. And he was able to be trained. So in this method we are going to be giving you now, it is not a method that says when one, one end, the other one starts. No. This method is in continuum. It is a continuous method. Now, what are these methods? Number one is person-oriented discipleship. Person-oriented discipleship. In this level of discipleship, we are dealing with the heart of the person you are talking to. You, the mentor, the discipler, the person you are coming to meet, you are trying to help him to know the person of Jesus. That is why it's called person-oriented discipleship. You are helping him to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. I want to know Jesus. So I am introducing Christ to the person. It can happen anywhere. I can meet somebody anywhere and introduce Christ. Philip went to Samaria and preached Christ. So here you meet someone, can be in your shop, can be in the bus, can be in your, in your football field. You, by one means or the other, you help him to know what Jesus Christ has done to provide him the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. To others, you are helping them to understand who Jesus is. They have believed in Jesus on a peripheral level, but you are trying to open their mind to understand that this Jesus Christ is not just a prophet who God said to man, teach us what we will do. No, he has come to act something, to save he said, he has not come to, to be served, but to do what? To serve and to give himself as a ransom. So he's not just a prophet who's coming to teach you rules and regulation. He's coming to give himself as a ransom. By the time the person understands the person of Jesus, you have done the first point. But that first point does not end because you don't only understand the person of Jesus once. You keep knowing him. Paul said that I may know him and the power of his word, resurrection. So in this area, you are basically helping somebody to experience Jesus, to know who Jesus is, to accept him and to know him more and more. Hallelujah. The second one is content-oriented discipleship. In this content-oriented uh, uh, discipleship, it is where a mature Christian uh, and a seriously interested someone else Either somebody who is also a Christian or someone who has not been a Christian is being helped to know better the teachings of Christ. You are looking at the content. It is just like you have this book. Now, I'm going to introduce this book to you. This book is very nice. After I finish introducing the book to you, the next thing is you open the book and begin to read the content of the book. So here, you have known Jesus, but now I am getting into the nitty-gritty of Jesus. I am taking, I'm giving you the cognitive knowledge, the play area of head knowledge. You don't know one, you have attracted me. It is affection domain, or affective domain in teaching. But this one is cognitive. The other one, by my feelings and by my emotions, I have accepted this person of Jesus. But this one, I want to now know him deeper, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection. So in this area, you are not the person you are discipling, whether an unbeliever to become a Christian, whether a, a, a younger believer or a, you know, a mate believer, you are bringing into him the doctrines of Christ. Hallelujah. You help him to understand what is faith, what is divinity, what is life, what is death. 
Why is resurrection important in Christianity? What is Christianity actually? You help him to grow in this in-depth knowledge. You teach him about restitution, restoration, sanctification. He began to learn about resurrection of the dead. You teach him about, you know, uh, how to this gift of the Spirit, who is the Holy Spirit, what does it do? All these deep things is in the content. So in that first level or first method, you are the person knows Jesus. In this one, he is doing him deeper. You see? Now, even in this level, you are still, you the person of Jesus is not removed. You continue knowing Jesus and entering into the content of who Jesus is. Hallelujah. So this one is the content-oriented discipleship. Now, the last one is the task-oriented discipleship. Now that I have known Jesus, now that I have understood the content, and I am still understanding because it does not end, I can't stop knowing Jesus, and I can't stop learning about him. It is a continuous something. I will continue to learn, but I go into the next method or the next you know, category, which is tax-oriented discipleship. Now, in this one is the practicum, the practicalizing aspect. All I have known about Jesus, all I have believed about Jesus, all I have learned on Christ and the word of God, I should be able to live it out. I am now working at my salvation with fear and trembling. I am now practicalizing. If I know about the life of Christ, let it be seen in me. Let Jesus be seen in you. Timothy was instructed by Paul. He said, uh, 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 what did he say again? <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, be an example of believers in words, in conduct. Hallelujah. Now, it is in character and in learning. That is where the character of that Jesus you have known, that is the character of the content you have learned to begin to manifest in your life. And then the next task is for you to introduce it to another person. So in this area, your life is completely changed. Your heart is changed. Your head is changed. And now your actions are changing. Hallelujah. Your life is changed. Your head is changed. Your actions are changing. There is no way the spirit of Christ can come into you and your morality will not change. Because you are now being led by the Spirit. So after you have known the person of Christ, you have understood the content of the gospel, it reflects in your life. You grow in this grace. It is not something that ends. It is a continuous thing. You keep knowing Christ, you keep understanding the content, and your life keeps changing. So you keep having change. Change, they are new every morning. So you see, discipleship does not only end in winning the soul to Christ, but this soul knows Jesus, he have understood the teachings of Christ, and then he now also reflects everything about Christ through the Spirit in his life. Hallelujah. I believe that is clear. All right, let's go to the next point, number four. In number four, we'll look at, or lesson four, spirituality and discipleship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 to 14, the Bible says, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. What does that mean? If you are a natural person, no, you can be born again and still be a natural person. You can be an, an unbeliever is a natural man. You can be born again and still be natural. What do I mean by that? If you are not manifesting the spirit of Christ that is in you, you will still be acting like mere men. That was why Paul told the Galatians, Oh ye foolish Galatians. Oh you what? Foolish Galatians. And somewhere in the scriptures again, he said, You are mere men. I'm going to come to that point. You are what? Mere men. So it takes spirituality to really be a good discipler. If I must disciple a person, someone to, to know Christ, I myself would have also known him. So spirituality is the state of being spiritually transformed and conscious. Hallelujah. By being born again, I have become spirit. By walking in the consciousness of my being born again, I become spiritual. 
Now, the Bible tells us in John chapter 3, verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, because I am born of the spirit, I am spirit. That is the first level of spirituality. The other one, the spirituality in it is that I begin to live in the consciousness of the spirit that I have become. Now, I have not become the spirit of Moses or the spirit of Elijah or the spirit of Noah or the spirit of Adam. I have become the spirit of Christ because the manifestation of the spirit of God in the believer is not the manifestation of the spirit of Moses or Elijah or anyone else before or after Christ. It is nobody but Christ. I manifest the spirit of Christ. So the Holy Spirit operating in me is called the spirit of Christ. Not in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Not in the spirit and the power of Moses. But in the spirit of Christ. Romans chapter 8 verse 9. In fact from 8 to 9 it says, If the Holy Spirit is in you, you are not in the flesh. But say anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ, he's not of him. That's why the person who has the spirit of Christ does not operate like Elijah or Moses. He operates like Christ. That's why when the apostles wanted to command fire from heaven, it is not bad. Elijah commanded fire from heaven and destroyed some people. Wonderful. That was the spirit of God operating Elijah. Are you hearing me? But the spirit that we receive is not the spirit of God as in manifestation in Elijah. It is the spirit of God as in manifestation as the spirit of Christ. And so that is why discipleship is about making me to be like Christ, not like Elijah or Moses. Jesus Christ, God told the apostles when they were at the Mount of Transfiguration, he says, this is my beloved son, hear me, sorry, hear him. And when they lifted up their eyes, they didn't see Elijah. They didn't see the Moses. That is the law and the prophet. They saw who? Only Christ. That's what Paul also said. I seek to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. So when I'm preaching, I am preaching Christ. So spirituality is about being born again and manifesting the character of the spirit. That's why I say I am spiritual. So if I am born again, I am spirit. He that is born of the spirit is spirit. But I have not understood to manifest the character of the spirit. I may still be carnal. I may still be tossed here and there. So my discipleship becomes more effective and stronger if I have been born again and I am maturing in that. In other words, my consciousness of who I am in that Christ is seen. I have become Christ you know, Christ in the human form. You know, the Savior shall come from Zion. I am becoming like Christ himself. As Christ, for the better word is, as Christ himself. Praise the Lord. So, the Bible says, But as many as receive him, to them he gave the power to become sons of God, even to them that believe in them, who are born, not of the human will, not of the flesh, but of God. And God is the Spirit. Hallelujah. So, spirituality starts with being born again and being conscious of who you are as a spirit. That consciousness actually helped me a lot. When you have this consciousness, nobody can part up you. Nobody can frustrate you. Nobody can intimidate you, no matter how highly placed or how lowly placed. Because he that is born of the spirit is spirit. Hallelujah. So, discipleship, as we have said earlier, the process of grooming someone who has to know Christ and to become, you know, matured in the Lord. All these two things put together, my spirituality helps me to become a good disciple. Hallelujah. Spirituality is important in discipleship because it takes your spirituality to manifest the Christ that is in you. In fact, spirituality is the primary purpose of, spirit, of discipleship because in discipleship, we are helping the sinner to become born again and become a spirit, and then we are now grooming him to manifest that spiritual nature he has received in God. That spiritual nature is the spirit of Christ, and that spirit of Christ is the divine nature of God that is given to man. Remember, the Bible says that we have been, you know, uh, we are to conform to the image of a son. Hallelujah. That is it. So, discipleship is actually the primary goal is spirituality at the end of the day it's not religiosity but what 
spirituality. We are aiming to bring people to become like Christ. And then God is calling me as a spiritual leader, calling you as a spiritual leader to go and replicate what he has done in your life by bringing the same gospel to someone else who believes that the gospel will now bring him in to uh, help him. If you are not spiritual, you cannot receive what God is, is giving to you. So being spiritual is being conscious of the spirit that you are in Christ. If you are born again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we are going to go further to learn further things. Now, the next point I want to talk about is religious entrepreneurship. Now, we have to distinguish discipleship from religious entrepreneurship. Now, one concept that is paramount in the church today is church growth. Hallelujah. Church growth. We want the church to grow. And because we don't know what the church is, we do another thing in the name of church growth. Church growth is what Jesus Christ said. He said, I will build my church and the gate of hell shall not prevail. So when anybody believes in Christ, he is added to the body of Christ. And the Lord added unto them daily those who have been what? Saved. And the, the gate of hell, they are talking about they are having eternal life. They will not go to death. They have passed from death to life. I know that most times we quote that scripture. Oh, uh, the gate of hell shall not prevail. It's good. We can quote it in everything. But the original meaning of that, I will build my church and the gate of hell shall not prevail, mean that I, but upon this rock, which is our trust in Jesus Christ, people are brought to the saving grace of Jesus and matured. So what is religious entrepreneurship? Religious entrepreneurship is the state where we take advantage of people and make them to become members of our religious organization. And indeed, they are not yet born again. Discipleship is not going about to look for people to join your church. So that they become plenty. You now have plenty of people coming to your plenty. But how many of them have come to the church of Jesus Christ? They have come to the church of OKK. Have they come to the church of Jesus Christ? Somebody can be in the local church, what we call local church. That is organizational churches we have here and there. But they are not in the church of Jesus Christ. They are not members of the body of Christ. When it happens, we say, oh, the body of Christ in Nigeria, the body of Christ in Ghana, the body of... I say, which one is the body of Christ? The, you know, all these things we call church here and there. These are all, you know, ministerial organizations. We are... Those whom God have called into the ministry, use them as a platform to mean souls and disciple them, which is wonderful. But it is not that, that people rush to become full members of those organizations does not mean that they are in Christ. So in discipleship, we are not interested in how many people come to our congregation. We are interested in how many of them have we traveled until Christ is born in them. And when that happens, even we ourselves, the pastors, cannot manipulate them because they have become, they have known what we know. Every pastor's aim is to make sure that every single church member becomes like Christ, just as the pastor has become like Christ. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Eh? Now, see, as I'm, as, I'm, as I'm like Christ, that's what I want to make you. I teach my church members on the word so that they can know, so that even me, myself, cannot deceive them. If I say anything wrong, they will know because I will not hide anything from them. But in religious entrepreneurship, you keep the people in ignorance so that you can tread on their ignorance and manipulate them and teach all kinds of mysticisms and teach all kinds of, you know, things, quoting scriptures, twisting it here and there. And the people say, hallelujah, hallelujah. And they accept it. That is not discipleship. So discipleship is not about going to gather people to become part and parcel of your religious organization, just like that but bringing them to the saving grace of Jesus and mentoring them to become like Christ, as Christ, in character and in learning. Hallelujah. That is why discipleship is the core of the church. Now, if your church grows, that is to say, if your ministerial organization called church has a lot of people coming, it's wonderful. But I have to concentrate on each of them and start making sure 
the people that I have trained first and have imbibed and to know to become like Christ like me, they also begin to help others. Hallelujah. So if not, they will, we are just gathering people to tell them what their itching ear want to hear. When they gather, we begin to load them with program, open program, open program, open program, open program. You hit, like my friend will say, I hit program, hit program, hit program, hit program. You are doing program, program, program. These people don't have proper time for proper discipleship. Huh? Today it is enough is enough. Tomorrow is the, this my auntie. Why do me like this? Next week it is this pot must break. The other week it is uh, anointing for for becoming the richest man in town. Next week it is this another week. When we they eat food, you are training your children with uh, uh, snacks and all these things. This uh, fast food. When we they eat better food, solid food, better food for the children. So how do they, they become like chaff? Anywhere they go, they become like chaff. They are in, in a short while, they hear another person doing another program like that. Whoa, they go, you say, oh God, I return my member. How will you return them? They are not even members of the body of Christ. They are members of your body, not Christ. So the essence of this teaching is if you are gathering people in the church to have 10,000, 50,000, 1,000, 2,000, 500, 250, 170, no matter the number, Make sure that the aim of that thing you call church should be evangelism and what? Discipleship. Now, even if you're going to hold any program, let the program be program that will build them up. Say, grow in grace. How do I grow in grace? Through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we must show religious entrepreneurship so that we don't build carnal people. Religiosity is different from spirituality. Somebody becomes very religious. He knows all the religious norms. He knows how to say hallelujah. He knows how to say, oh, hallelujah, glory, glory. What God cannot do does not exist. Hallelujah. He knows how to say, you know, and the outpouring was so great. Oh, it was awesome. It was awesome. He did not have to sing worship song. Oh, how, how great thou art. But how much of Christ do they know? Do they know the person of Christ? The content of Christ is their life manifesting what they have eaten. There's no way you will eat good food. Your body will not manifest what you have eaten. The food we eat is seen in how it manifests in our physical appearance. So you cannot be eating the real food. The people say, oh, church has become nonsense. Why would church not become nonsense? What are we eating in church? You come to church on Monday. It's seven steps on how to become a rich man. Come to church on Tuesday. 21 steps on how to become a successful businessman. You come to church on Wednesday. Or, or, uh, 35 steps on how to climb the mountains of ca your career. <laughs> all those things. How to fight your enemies. How to break the evil pot. How to... All those dragons. This person will live in fear. We live in torment. We live in... You know, so everybody's a suspect. <laughs> Is that what we want? But when they are loaded and loaded, their spiritual immunity is so strong. No weapon formed against them shall prosper. They will, the Spirit of God will teach them how to prosper in their business and how to prosper what they do. Now, if you're going to teach prosperity and teach business, and teach, that will be jara. It will not become the core of everything you are doing. So that they are eating the right food. That is why we have so many churches but no reflection of Christ in our society. Because instead of Christ being formed in them, who is being formed? The general overseer. Eh? We, the, the, the man, the, 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 what do you call it? The center man is the person. Oh, the God of my father, this person, the God of the God of my father, the God of the God of my father, my father God, my father God. Who is your own God? You see, we are not making disciples for Christ. We are making disciples for ourselves. Remember when God created Adam, he created Adam in his own image and in his own likeness. But when Adam fell, the Bible says, and Adam produced children in his own image and in his own likeness. You see, Genesis chapter 5. God made Adam in his own image. Adam was to produce children in the image of God. But what Adam produced, because he had disconnected from God, he started producing children after his own image. That's why God sent Jesus Christ to do what? As his express image, so that we will conform to the image of Christ, not to the image of Bishop Timothy. 
Not to the image of Bishop Elu Eluwa. Not to the image of Bishop Abdullahi Abubakar. <laughs> but to, to, to conform to the image of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So we must shun religious entrepreneurship. You know, you see, you are going for evangelism every day. What is your aim? Just to get people to come and touch, and then, you know, you know, uh, you know we, we now run three shifts. We have, uh, you know, first service, 500,000, second service, 200, you know, and we come and start. No, 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 no. That's not popularity and egotism is not our goal. Our goal is that everybody becomes like Christ. How, how do you think to be that we have a church of 100,000 and they are all like Christ? At least 70% are like Christ. A church of 200 people, 70% are like Christ. Let's just leave 30% who don't want to be. They, they got another church of 10 people, 70% of the 10 people are like Christ. How do you think our society will be? We have politicians who are Christians but are not like Christ. They go there, they are swallowed up as if they don't even exist. You go to the offices, you can't know who is the Christian. Corruption everywhere. You go to the military, almost all of them are Christians, but what do we see? Corruption. You go to the police, all of them, almost all of them are Christians. What do you see? Corruption. You go to the judiciary, almost all of them are Christians. What do you see? Corruption. Why are they corrupt? Because the place they are eating, they are eating con bad food. They are not eating nutritious food. So there is no Christ being formed in them. It is their the, the church denomination that is formed in them. Their general overseer is formed in them. Some of them are having the spirit of some dead preachers. The spirit of me, God's word is formed in them. The spirit of uh, uh, a friend is saying, Name them. Oh, uh, Babalola is formed in them. The spirit. I'm not saying all those men are bad men. Spirit of Benson Oidahosa. Uh, uh, Benson Oidahosa is formed in them. The spirit of dead men and the spirit of living men, made perfect, is formed in them. God have mercy. These men are not bad, though, but it is not them we want to form. He said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Not looking unto any man. I am not coming, Bishop Timothy is not coming to make you to look like me. You are wanting to, what I have eaten, I want you to eat so that you become like Christ, not like me. When the woman of Isha, when the woman of Samaria got to know Christ, he went and told her people, when they came based on what they had from her, they encountered Jesus for themselves. And they said, we no longer believe because of what you said. We believe because we too have tested and seen what you tested and saw. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's stop introducing ourselves. It's not about our religious organization because at the end of time, nobody will know your church in them. Whether you're a member of Jesus Christ of Nazareth Ministries, you are a member of Christ Jesus Ministry, you are a member of Messiah Emmanuel Ministry, you are a member of Heaven and Earth International Jesus Christ is Coming Soon Ministry, it doesn't matter. All these names doesn't matter. They are just labels, just you know, ministerial for identification. What matters is Christ and Him crucified. Second Timothy chapter 4. Verse 3 to 4. For all the time, for, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own loss, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ear, and they will be turned away from the truth and turn their mind to what? To fables. Now, in 1 Corinthians 3 1 to 3, Paul says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for he that told you are not able to bear it, neither are you now able. For you are carnal. For where there is envy among you and divisions, are ye not carnal, walking as men, men? For some of you say, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, and I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? So see all this strife, envy, even among the pastors, self pastor is fighting, another pastor is, this pastor, fighting, fighting each other. That even native doctors have become pastors, criminals have become pastors, occultic men have become pastors, and blended normally because Christ has been removed from his church. And then what we have is just a chaff. And so it's easy for them to enter and blend and continue with the, you know, the, the mumbo jumbo that we are doing and every place. The purpose of discipleship is to end this thing. That's the key to destroy this thing. That's the key to chase away darkness from the church and bring light back. And that is what all of us must focus on. Hallelujah. Don't say, oh, it's pastors that will do it. Every child of God has been called to do that. Everyone who is born again and you have been discipled. For the day you are born again, start. But under the supervision of your mentor. So that you can manifest and grow and help others. 
You don't need to be appointed a pastor or ordained a deacon or deaconess or any title in church. No, start now. As soon as you are born again, you are called to start serving in the church under supervision and win others to Christ. Finally, let us look at effective discipleship strategy. What are the strategies that we must use if we must do our discipleship very well? Number one, you yourself that is discipling others, you too must also be maturing in Christ. Hallelujah. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be ye followers of me, as I am also follower of Christ. Number two, you must give yourself to the ministry of the word and prayer. That means to say, you must be one who have studied the scriptures and know the difference between the, the general Bible and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that when you are going out for evangelism, you are not going to preach Moses and Elijah. You are going to preach Christ. Acts chapter 6 verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So that you don't think that charity is the gospel. You know, sharing of rice and beans and money and all that. That's not the gospel. They can help they are, they, are, they are not the gospel. So you yourself that is going to disciple, you must make sure you know what this gospel is by being very studious, learning and praying by the help of the Holy Spirit to know how to distinguish between the gospel and the rest of the scripture so that you don't misinterpret the scripture in the process of grooming another person for Christ. Because the way you groom the other person is the way he's going to turn out to become. Number three, you must disciple in such a way that the person you are discipling will end up discipling another person effectively. Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2, he says, And the things which thou have had me among many witnesses, the same commit thou unto faithful men, who will teach others also. So when you are discipling, know that this person is going to disciple another person. Number four, rather than simply teaching religious rule, uh, teach the person the gospel. Don't begin to teach them rules and regulation. Number one, uh, thou shalt not that. No, teach him the gospel and the emphasis on the gospel will take charge. You know, be an example of believer in your character, in your conduct, not just rules and regulations. Anything you say, don't do. Don't do. Don't do. Don't do. Yeah, they are good to say, don't do, don't, don't do. Look at them yourself. You yourself should not be in that same thing. So the person is watching you. Moreover, as I say, it is not about religious rules and regulation. It's about the gospel by words and by example. Hallelujah. The next one, uh, teach disciple to become dependent on the word of God. Do not train that disciple to depend on you. Everything. Uh, pray for me. Give me this. Uh, uh, there are some people. Any free team must be pastor or uh, senior pastor, junior pastor, elder or somebody. Uh, let the person not depend on you. Help him to be independent. That is how they train people. You train them to, to know how to stand on their own feet. Hallelujah. My speech and my proclamation were not with the persuasive word of men or wisdom of men, but of the demonstration of the gospel so that your faith might not be based on man's wisdom, but on the gospel, the power of God. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 to 5. So teach them to be independent. Let them not become dependent on you. Help them to depend on the word of God in everything they do, not on themselves, not on you, but on God. Because one day you may not be there to help them. So what do they do? You must make them to grow. Hallelujah. Number six, always continue to follow up. Don't just preach and dump. You must follow up, praying with them, studying the word of God with them, opening their eyes. In the book of Acts 15, 36 and Acts 18, 23, Bible says, and so many days later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go and visit the brethren in every city where we have preached and see how they do. After we have departed, we went to them in Galatia and Pega and strengthened their faith. Hallelujah. Strengthening them. So you don't just speak and dump. You must always be close to them. Visit them. Both time, uh, 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 prompt visit and imprompt visit. So that you can help them to be strong in the Lord. And then finally, don't disciple in your own strength. It is not by your power. Draw your strength from the Lord because you are not going to bring them to learn nonsense. You are teaching them Christ. So draw strength from the Lord and let the grace of God help you. I will say be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Hallelujah. Amen. So that is it. 
Brethren, if a man is overtaken by a fault, he who has spiritual rest, to such a one with the spirit of meekness. In this last point, I am saying that it is always good for a male to disciple another man and women and another or a mixture of people. Don't go and create room where you will fall into sin. Don't create, if you go that, this person I'm discipling, I'm ending up gossiping with him. Send another person, don't go again. Or go with other brethren so that you don't have time to gossip. <laughs> because if you are gossiping like that, it shows that you too, you need discipleship. <laughs> so you don't go and turn it to not to glorify God again. Don't turn your discipleship program into a, a program of destroying one another instead of building one another. Hallelujah. You see, if one is falling, you should help him. But watch yourself so that you do not what? Fall. So understand that you are born again of the Spirit of God and you should live as such. And your major task is to help others know Christ and be matured in him and leave him out anywhere they are. And with that, the church of Jesus Christ will be marching on. And indeed, the gate of hell shall not prevail. But if we continue to teach our own self and teach denominationalism and teach make people to depend on us and we become the new God they worship, the gate of hell will not only prevail, it will swallow God's church. But one thing is sure, the true church of Jesus Christ, which is not denominational here and there, it is a spiritual entity, universal church, the gate of hell shall not prevail over it. But if we want that to happen, we must work hard to make sure that church is filled up. God has kept us here to be gathering people through our various churches, organizations, so that they can become, we are reconciling men to Christ, not to ourselves. And we must focus on that if we want God to do a new thing. The revival we are praying about is not through prayers, it's through discipleship. We want the new move of God, a new move of God. We are praying for a new move of God. Stop praying for a new move of God. Do this thing and you will see the move will happen. And the name of the Lord will be glorified. Hallelujah. We'll end it here today. And uh, next week will be the end of the course CD, Christian Dynamics. So if you have any questions so far, you are free to send in your question. And if you have not yet enrolled as a regular student, you are still free. The advert is still going on. Admission is still going on. You can join. Father, we thank you for the tonight class. We have dissected this teaching on discipleship in a short time. It's a broad thing. But we trust that the little we have learned and we keep learning will help us to be instruments in your hand to bring revival, returning of men from darkness to light, from death to life, through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for answer prayers in Jesus' name. As you taught the life of everyone who have learned tonight and who will learn even after this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give our offering to support the cause of this work. Father, accept our offering. We give to the glory of your name. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Now, if you are giving and supporting the preaching of the truth, it is better than criticizing based on ignorance. We are teaching the truth of the gospel, and many people who hear it will learn. So, instead of you to go to Facebook and be quarreling, 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 sponsor the teaching of the gospel so that they will hear and change. Not complain, what is happening? Oh, this is happening in church today. Wow. The way to end that nawa is through the preaching and teaching of this gospel. And so that is why your offering and your giving is necessary to help it go further. God bless you. See you again on Thursday for another class. Bye-bye.